know, Haiti has been an unspeakable tragedy. It has been horrific and continuing. It clearly is an earthquake and far more. Context, history, and institutions play an important role here. It's a real honor for us to have with us tonight Professor Mark Danner to speak about these issues. Uh, he'll be talking first, and then we'll have time for questions and comments after his talk. Uh, Mark Danner is one of the premier public intellectuals writing on politics and ideas in the United States today. For much of the last quarter century, he has covered conflict and war throughout the world. His writing, his observations, his insight had been brought to bear on Central America, on the Balkans, on Iraq and the Middle East, and of course, on Haiti. His most recent book, Strip Bear the Body, begins and has a strong focus on the New Yorker articles he wrote about Haiti. It would take too long to fully give him credit in terms of an introduction, uh, he has written, he was a staff writer for The New Yorker. Uh, he writes extensively for The New York Review of Books. He's won a National Magazine Award. He's won three Emmys. He's won a MacArthur Fellowship. Uh, and I, uh, uh, but I think what truly characterizes him is his passion, the quality of his insight, and what he has brought to writing in terms of redefining some of the defining public debates of our time. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce and please join me in welcoming Mark Dan. States um, was built in the early part of the last century. 
And that is what it looks like now after the earthquake is struck. Um, it symbolizes a lot to me, as I, that, that image, as I hope to make clear. In any event, I went with him for a visit to uh, that building, where he tried to give the interim president, General Henri Namphy, who had been awarded power after the fall of Jean-Claude Duvalier and the end of the 30-year Duvalier dictatorship, he tried to give him the plans for the new Haiti, the new Haiti, remake Haiti, rebuild Haiti. Uh, he didn't succeed, but that night, night he took me to a party up in Pétionville, where I had my first introduction to the Haitian elite, a gathering of a couple of hundred of the most beautiful people I've ever seen, immensely charming, wearing the newest fashions from New York, uh, from Paris, all of them educated abroad, uh, amazing people who I spent several hours with talking about Haiti, talking about Haiti. And I drove and got to know the country, which was then in this kind of maelstrom of political violence, riots on the street, soldiers shooting, uh, <coughs> makeshift demonstrations every day. Um, on every street corner, it seemed politicians declaiming, people starting new political parties people starting newspapers, people starting radio stations. It was a kind of big bang of politics, absolutely enthralling and inspiring. And it seemed to me to be, as I subtitled my article for the New York Times magazine, Haiti's transition to democracy. Um, that was 24 years ago. And in the time since, there have been 14, depending on your count, 14 rulers. Uh, Haiti has not yet reached democracy. Um, and this uh, building, it seems to me, is a symbol of a couple things. One is a natural disaster, as we all know, that struck Haiti several weeks ago. 7.0 magnitude earthquake, huge earthquake, um, that has killed, though we don't know the exact number, the Haitian government, which is really non existent now, doesn't know the exact number, but is putting out the number of between 150 and 200,000. Haitians died, or people died, I should say, Haitians and uh, people from other countries as well. Uh, we have no idea really what that number, real number, is, and we are unlikely ever to know, because the Haitian government, as many of you may have seen on television uh, uh, and news reports lately, is taking corpses in trucks, trucking them out to a place I know very well called Titeye, which means little nothing. It's a swampland outside of the capital, and it's been used for many years, including under the Duvalier regime, to dispose of political opponents, uh, or just people the regime murdered. Uh, they would go out there, mass graves or big graves would be dug periodically every week, and bodies would be taken out there. Now that's being used to bury uh, hundreds, uh, probably thousands of earthquake victims. We think of this as a natural disaster. It's, of course, part natural, natural disaster uh, and very, very much a part man-made disaster. Um, Haiti is a fascinating, mesmerizing, entrancing place which people tend to become obsessed with. I certainly, on that first visit, became obsessed with it and it remained so for nearly a quarter century. Um, uh, I came upon the other day, actually it led me to write the piece that led Harley to give his talk in the New York Times, just a little line by Paul Farmer. Do you, people know who Paul Farmer is? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, you would, I think. I think he's been here a number of times. Uh, I've shared the podium with him a couple of times. He's a remarkable man. But he simply said, it is humbling to see the relief efforts be so slow, in large part because delivery of services was so weak before the quake. And of course there is a, a world disguised in those handful of words. It means simply that whatever the death toll finally is, uh, a very, very large part of that death toll will not be due to the trembling of the earth, but the state of the Haitian government and the state of Haiti itself. And that uh, reality lies in history and in politics, not in natural disaster. I have been disturbed, and this was the other source, I suppose, of um, of this article I wrote, uh, by the tendency in the press, and particularly in the televised press, uh, covering this irresistible story with so much suffering, uh, so much bloodshed, so much anguish, which of course television cameras love, um, to look at Haiti or begin to look at Haiti as the kind of Christ of nations. Uh, the suffering 
nation or suffering people nailed to the cross as if they are doomed to suffer. And one of the things I'd like to argue today uh, is that there is nothing mystical, nothing magical about the suffering of Haiti. Earthquakes come and go, as we know well in the area. Uh, but the added tens of thousands who will die because of the lack of nation state capacity, um, those hundred thousands die because of decisions made by men and women over a very, very long time. Um, I think also those decisions in this history uh, gives us a view on what you hear again and again. <coughs> President Clinton said it the other day, no other people in the world would be so patient and calm in the face of so much suffering. President Clinton, as you may know, spent his honeymoon uh, in Haiti, and he and his wife Hillary have been very much attached to the country ever since. Um, anyway, a few words about the present situation in Haiti, and let's, uh, oh, I guess I'm supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. I was about to say, let's go to the next. Oops. There's the epicenter of the earthquake, just south of the Rio Prince. Um, and some figures on the degree of destruction, we've all seen this. Jacques Mel, a beautiful city on the southern coast, 50 to 60% destroyed. Um, uh, Port-au-Prince itself, of course, where the, by far the, the largest amount of damage is, where whole neighborhoods have simply been crushed. And a number of hotels, including Montana, where it used to stay, have completely collapsed. Killing almost everyone in it. Um, a few words about the present situation to start us off. Okay, this is, I find a very interesting map of Haiti, which simply tells you the percent of people in a given area who live by less than $2 a day. Uh, the dark areas are 92 to 94 percent. In other words, everybody in those areas lives at less than $2 a day. Uh, Red, 87 to 89 percent, and so on. And of course, the good areas, including the capital, 57 percent. So the degree of poverty is devastating. We've run out a lot of statistics. We've heard them in the last few weeks. I'll give only one, which I draw from Paul Farmer. It's about maternal death. That is, death while giving birth. In the United States, the number per 100,000 of live births is 7.1 maternal deaths. Thank seven minus nine out of 100,000 live births. In Haiti, that number is 1,400. So we're talking about a few hundred miles separating two complete, distinct, uh, radically different worlds when it comes to how people live. The leaf map of Haiti, Columbus discovered Haiti in 1492, his first voyage. Uh, you will see some basic characteristics. He went back to Spain in a conversation with Isabella. She said, what was it like? He took a piece of paper from her writing desk, crumpled it up, and dropped it on the desk. It's like that, he said. Haiti means mountainous. And you will see, that's the Dominican Republic, green. The rains come that way, and the rains are often exhausted by the time, not always, but by the time they get over to the mountainous part um, of Haiti. So much less farmland, it's more, dense, it's more densely populated, but much less arable land. Uh, we'll have some more um, comparisons between the two later on. I said Columbus um, uh, discovered it, quote unquote, or encountered it, whatever you'd like to say. Uh, they were, uh, the ships were on Christmas Eve of 1492. They spent Christmas there. Uh, the people aboard the Santa Maria got very drunk. You probably haven't heard this in social studies. Uh, the people aboard the Santa Maria got very drunk. They gave the tiller to a cabin boy who, not surprisingly, ran the ship aground right there. <laughs> They woke up in the morning not very happy. Columbus was very angry, as he recounts in his notebooks, uh, which I commend you, the wonderful reading. Uh, what to do? The ship was irretrievable. They decided to break it down. Uh, they made it, they took the wood and everything that could be salvaged, and they built a little settlement called La Navidad after Christmas Day, um, right there. They discovered, uh, archaeologists actually discovered it, the remains of it in 1985. 
Uh, Columbus sailed off. He came back the following year thinking he would find a thriving uh, settlement. Instead, he found found corpses. Uh, they got in some disagreements with the uh, Arawak Indians, a half, a half a million of whom, best estimate, inhabited the island at that time, and the Arawaks uh, killed them all. Um, I'm going to go quickly over the early history here, because we last don't have that much time. Um, but the Arawaks did not last very long. They were enslaved by the Europeans. This is a familiar story. They work in a few ne meager gold mines, among other things. Uh, and around about 1520, um, there began to be imported, <coughs> first of all, a few, and then a huge number of black Africans, African slaves. This was not least to do with the fact that Bartolome de las Casas, and some of you in this room know this history very well, uh, denounced the mistreatment of the Indians, uh, the natives, uh, and the imports of slaves uh, began. Um, gradually, let's see, you see um, right there, there's Haiti. Cuba, you can see Cuba from right here. Uh, um, and Florida, obviously, Miami is right over here. So a few hundred miles from uh, the U.S. coast. Um, gradually, this part of the island was taken up by French buccaneers. There was a huge and thriving pirate trade uh, in the Caribbean, attacking mostly Spanish ships from back to, uh, back to Europe. They took up residence on the Ile de Tortue, uh, and you had a gradual amount of French settlements uh, and various wars between French and Spanish until in 1697, the Treaty of Ryswick, the island was divided. And the next century, the 18th, is the key action for Haiti, or as it was then called, saint Domingue. It became, uh, quite quickly, by the mid part of the 18th century, the richest colony on the face of the globe. Uh, the importation of Africans continued and built an enormous slave-powered production factory. It was producing by the end of the century, or by the 1790s, um, half the world's sugar. Sugar at the time was the great cash crop, of course, coming from the Americas. Uh, more than uh, two-thirds of its coffee. Huge proportions of its indigo and cocoa. Um, now, how did this happen? Well. Um, Haitians are very well aware of the fact that all of them, just about all of them, uh, are descendants of slaves. If you go to the museum across from that now crushed palace, Musée de Pantheon, you'll see all of these displays behind glass of these horrible implements, iron implements, uh, iron shackles, iron swords, various uh, weapons to torture slaves. And under it, there's a placard that says, our ancestors were subjected to the humiliation of being bought and sold at public markets, branded like beasts, exposed to forced labor and punishment of an indescribable horror. Um, that museum has a great uh, deal of very awful stuff in it. Um, I want to give you one picture of what Haiti was like at this time. It was now accounting for more than half the foreign exchange of France. There were diplomatic discussions about possibly trading ha Haiti uh, for Canada. <laughs> Swiss traveler in 1779 went out to, uh, against the advice of his uh, hosts, went out to a sugarcane field. There were about 100 men and women of different ages, all occupied in digging ditches in the cane field. The majority of them naked were covered in rags. The sun shone down with full force on their heads. Sweat rolled from all parts of their bodies. Their limbs, fatigued with the weight of their picks, strained themselves to overcome every obstacle. A mournful silence reigned. Exhaustion was stamped on every face. Several foremen armed with long whips moved periodically between them, giving stinging blows to all who, worn out by fatigue, were compelled to take a rest. Men or women, young or old. So we have here half a million Africans. Uh, at the height of Haiti in the late part of the century. Um, they were ruled over by 40,000 whites. They ruled over them, essentially, through terror, through violence. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to understand Haiti in its modern form, you have to see that sea of Africans with these little islands of whites in their plantation houses and the feeling of vulnerability, which results in an enormous amount of violence, a very violent, violent slave culture. Uh, a lot of deaths, uh, slaves did not live very long, they did not reproduce much, 
which meant that there, it was much cheaper rather than to raise more slaves, it was much cheaper to import them. So by the time of the revolution, late in the century, uh, almost the entire population of slaves were African born, uh, spoke African languages, practiced African, African religions, etc. Meanwhile, you had an enormous amount of wealth accruing to a small number of families. Henry Adams talked about uh, Paris swarming with Creole families, this is 1789, who drew their income from the island, among whom were many whose political influence was great. So it's a powerful place. Uh, in the island itself, society enjoyed semi-Parisian ease and elegance, the natural product of an exaggerated slave si system combined with the manners, ideas, and amusements of a French proprietary caste. Part of these amusements, of course, was sex with slaves. And by the time of the revolution, um, there was a third class, or a third race, if you like. Uh, beyond the 40,000 whites, the 500,000 blacks were 30 to 40,000 mulattoes, uh, who became a key uh, political caste during the history of Haitian politics. Um, we had developed during the last century before the revolution a complicated color code, <laughs> of which, which I have excerpted yes, for you. Excerpted, I stress. Um, this is from uh, uh, a sociologist of the time, Moreau de saint Marcy, who himself was uh, mixed race, uh, did a huge study of Haiti. And you see that uh, mulatto, which I use, and which uh, foreigners tend to use, does not do justice to a rather complicated uh, set of determinations, which, of which this is only the beginning. This is simply talking about ancestors. In fact, when I first came to Haiti, one thing I will never forget, the man who had taken power to my friend was trying to see, uh, General Henri Namfi. Uh, everyone in the press was calling him a mulatto. Uh, mulatto has taken power. Uh, I was then, I was taken by another friend to a place called the Cerf Bellevue, which is a largely mulatto club, very elegant, key player in 200 years of Haitian history. Uh, and I was taken there for lunch, a great honor it was supposed to be. And uh, my friend excused himself at a certain point, and I eavesdropped on the conversation at the table next to mine. And I heard someone say, Oh, Sunafi, Sassano, il est, uh, what did he say? Il est bien grimo, quand même. Il est bien grimo. And I heard this and thought, what the? <laughs> well, I have no idea what that was. And my friend came back to the table, and I said, what is a grimo? And he looked at me in horror and said, where did you hear that? And I said, <laughs> right there, someone just said it. And he was very embarrassed. Uh, but he explained to me that uh, a glimo is a light-skinned, sort of mulatto, but who has kinky hair and wide nostrils. That's a glimo. Um, so there is a complicated, I'll talk more about this uh, in a bit, but there is a complicated color code going on uh, beneath the surface in Haiti. Um, in any event, by the time of the revolution, uh, 1790, which began with the Buddha ceremony in the north on the northern plains, a very famous one, was led by a man named Bukman, a uh, Voodoo priest. Um, uh, you had this very dramatic division between Africans, and I mean Africans, uh, African culture, uh, white French, and the, this key class in the middle of the mulattoes, who very often had been educated in France, and who were rich, and very often by this time owned land of their own. Um, the revolution is an extremely complicated story, uh, but one way to tell it is simply that uh, the slaves produced an amazing number of brilliant leaders. This is Toussaint Louverture, um, who, to whom Wordsworth devoted a poem, Kleist, a short story, famous figure capturing the European imagination of the time. He was a slave and a freed man in a plantation of the North. Toussaint Breda, the great uh, plantation, taught himself to read, taught himself war by reading uh, uh, Caesar's commentaries. Uh, he was the first uh, leader of the slaves, um, the slave armies. He eventually wanted to settle with Napoleon. Um, he went to a meeting, was captured, brought back to Europe. He died in prison there. Um, as Henry Adams said, Toussaint exercised on United States history and influences decisive is that of any European ruler. Before Bonaparte could reach Louisiana, he was obliged to crush the power of Toussaint. 
Um, and indeed, uh, it's likely that France would still hold the Louisiana Purchase were it not for Toussaint de Um Bonaparte hated him. Uh, as Adams writes, Toussaint seemed naturally to hate every action which Bonaparte wished to make heroic in the world's eyes. There was reason to fear that Toussaint would end in making Bonaparte ridiculous. For his conduct was, as it seemed to the First Council, a sort of Negro travesty of the consular regime. This idea of Negro tragedy also would recur again and again. Um, but if the blacks had lost, if that army had lost, uh, it is likely that the French, as Adam said, would have, would have rolled up the Pacific, uh, excuse me, up, up the uh, Mississippi. Uh, Toussaint was captured and killed. He was replaced by Jean-Jacques Dessalines. That's again Toussaint. There is Jean-Jacques, former slave. That's the victorious Jean-Jacques pointing to the flag, which was made by ripping the white center out of the French tricorn. <laughs> His motto was, coupe tête, boule caille. Cut off heads, burn houses. <laughs> it's admirable, I think, for its succinctness. <laughs> now, before, I can't talk much about the revolution, even though I'd love to. I recommend C.L.R. James, The Black Jacobins, still an incredible book, I think, about that revolution. But I should say, before they wrote the act of independence, uh, Dessalines' secretary intoned, for our declaration of independence, we should have the skin of a white for parchment, his skull for inkwell, his blood for ink, and a bayonet for pen. Um, in the Constitution was inscribed a line that lasted until the American occupation in 1915, never again shall con colonist or European set foot on this soil as master or landowner. This shall henceforth be the foundation of our Constitution. So this was born in nationalism, uh, in a desire to break free of the whites, uh, and in a very, very savage war. Savage, I should emphasize, on both sides, apocalyptic war. Probably half the population of Haiti was, was killed. Plantations were burned, extraordinary, apocalyptic, horrible damage. Um, now, Haiti became thereby, in 1804, when this flag was first flown, uh, this lead, by the way, was immensely fat. In those days, uh, portraitists uh, knew where they were getting paid. So he was, <laughs> he was depicted as a slender man, but he was immensely fat, and famously so. In any event, um, uh, this was the first successful, the only successful slave revolution in history. An incredible event. Uh, and if you look at the context of the times, you can imagine how shocking it must have been the entire colonial economy of the West uh, uh, depended on slavery. Slavery, uh, the, the uh, labor of enslaved people, enslaved Africans, underlay the economic prosperity, much of it, of Europe and the United States. So Haiti was the second independent republic in the hemisphere. Uh, you might think that the first, the United States, founded on the equality of all men. Um, might have recognized it. Instead, of course, the leaders of the United States were horrified. Uh, the reaction among political leaders was simple panic. Um, Dessalines represented the nightmare of incipient rebellion, incipient revolution. The entire South, of course, was dependent on the uh, uh, cash from the slave economy. The modern historian dubbed him Eugene Genovese, the reason dubbed him the Castro of his time. Uh, Haiti was isolated. Uh, the United States did not recognize it, and the event didn't recognize it until 1862 under Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Senator Robert Hayne of South Carolina said in 1824 quite clearly, our policy with regard to Haiti is plain, we never can acknowledge her independence. The peace and safety of a large portion of our union forbids us even to discuss it. Uh, wonderfully blunt. Um, so, the country was born in isolation, a trade embargo was slapped on, and also the imposition of vast reparations. Incredible, you know, in today's dollars, billions and billions of dollars uh, were demanded by France, reparations for the lost plantations, etc., uh, in order for France to begin trade with it, which Haiti eventually began to pay, and which weighed on the Haitian economy for a hundred years. Uh, the debt was rolled over and rolled over and rolled over, and eventually when the Americans invaded in 1950, it was in part to force payment of that debt, which had become American uh, under the National City Bank. Now we know that as Citigroup. <laughs> so uh, the characters don't change. Um, okay. 
So what do you do in a country that is devastated? 90% uh, of it is illiterate, fields are burned, it was the richest country in the, in the colony of the world in living memory. Uh, what do you do? Well, Toussaint originally tried to, in, in effect, reinstitute the slave system, forced labor. The ex-slaves rebelled, not surprisingly. There were several other attempts at this, and eventually, to make a very long and complicated story short, uh, the land was mostly divided up. So Haiti is the only revolution one can name to have taken, in effect, a modern export economy, though, albeit slave power, and made it into a nation of smallholders. Um, these reforms took about 40 years, uh, but what had been an international export-led economy, economy had been transformed into a nation of united smallholders. Sugar uh, disappeared, coffee became the main crop, and the country slipped into what Leslie Monaga, a former Haitian president, has called its two-world system. Uh, the low world of the countryside, which is mountainous, which is occupied or inhabited by small holders, ex-slaves who are black, speak African languages, or eventually Creole, uh, practice uh, voodoo, variations of voodoo as a religion, um, engage in common law of marriage, massage, farm, are small farmers, and are basically isolated. Uh, the high world, urban, with a new uh, elite made up of ex-officers, uh, mostly mulatto, uh, but some black. Um, so mulatto, mixed race, black, uh, looking to Europe, particularly the mulatto class, speaking French, um, uh, practicing Catholicism, practicing form formal marriage, cosmopolitan and sophisticated as opposed to the isolated countryside, and finally, and most importantly, uh, as a profession, practicing not farming, there were no large plantations to hold, but government, government. Uh, that is, there began to be an enormous fight uh, for the extractive mechanism of the state. Remember that the French had extracted the wealth from the country by use of slaves. How do you do that when the land has been given over to smallholders, when you no longer have the land? Well, as Matt Lundahl, who's a wonderful economist who's written a lot about Haiti, in his book, Peasants in Poverty, puts it rather puts succinctly, the administration, in other words, the government, was turned into a generator of legal and illegal incomes, accruing to the followers of the politicians who happened to be command, in command at the moment. And the supremacy of this group was always contested by others fighting for their turn. Which is to say that the underlying reality of Haiti, you know, the history is phantasmagorical, full of incredible characters, uh, Wonderful to read, immensely entertaining. The underlying reality, underlying reality has remained remarkably consistent. Uh, the machinery of power, uh, no matter who controls it, exists to funnel the resources of the country from the many to the few. And it is the pastime of the few to fight for that machinery, which means that you have an incredibly politicized elite, elite and counter elite, as it were. Uh, everything is political. This is again Leslie Monica may become involved in the struggle for power. All efforts to keep certain sectors of public life out of politics have failed. Perhaps nowhere else in the world are physicians and lawyers more engaged in active politics. Uh, the reputation earned by an engineer in a special field is regarded as a political trump. Politics extends its tentacles even into private life. Such is the encroachment of politics on all aspects of life that if a man does not go into politics, politics itself comes to him. So, from the beginning, no established method of succession, which is to say a constant struggle for power when somebody takes over, um, immediately someone is struggling to replace him. Uh, no tradition, obviously, which is implied by what I just said, of royal opposition. Uh, one Haitian president's overthrown or coup simply said a revolution in Haiti does not have the same meaning as it would have here. He was speaking in London after being overthrown. It's only our way of changing administrations. Here you have an election. Down there they have a revolution. So simple, simple, uh, simple rule. So no tra tradition of loyal opposition. 
politique de peau, which is to say epidermal politics, the politics of skin color, plays a role almost always, one way or another, often invisibly to foreigners, because it isn't much talked about, uh, taken for granted. Politique de bouleur, by which very often a black man is put in power, although uh, he is a puppet of also politique de marionette, of other groups, very often light-skinned groups. Um, so political, continuing political uh, instability, political, you can put it positive terms, political, uh, oops, sorry, uh, political, um, uh, what's the word, creativity, operatic politics, emperors, kings, um, presidents for life. Uh, since its independence, 40, I think it's now 45 men, one woman, have attained the palace and left it in various ways. One was executed, one committed suicide in the palace, two were assass assassinated, one was blown up uh, along with the palace. Not sure where that, why that happened or who did it. Uh, five died a more or less natural death within the palace, we think, and 20 or so were overthrown in, uh, in various ways. <laughs> Uh, so we want to read about coup d'etat, how they work, uh, their function. Haiti is, has a great history. Oh goodness, I'm taking too long. Um, let me just say that uh, after 1856, there were 16 presidents, two served out their terms. Uh, there was a period very often during this time, and indeed throughout Haitian history, you tend to have uh, what are known as parenthèses, or sometimes conjoncture, you know, parenthesis where a great many political figures fight for power, gain the palace, or overthrown. Fight for power, gain the palace, or overthrown. And eventually, after five or six, a strong man takes hold, kills a great many people very often, and retains the palace. So you have repression alternating with great periods of instability. One of the largest of those uh, happened in 1915, the period leading up to 1915, um, when uh, the president at the time was pulled out of the palace. Actually, I can't resist, you'll forgive me for reading this. This is just a great, uh, a great little memo from a cable from diplomats. And diplomatic cables, I feel, do not get enough attention. <laughs> this one's very well written. It's written by a young, I think he was in his 20s, American diplomat in 1915 in the Puerto Rican Embassy, who observed that that morning, a number of very well-dressed Haitian men, mostly mulatto, uh, in morning coats, so dressed uh, in evening where, or tuxedos, excuse me, morning beds, had pushed their way into the French legation where the current president, President Sam, had hidden himself. Uh, in fact, was hiding in the bathroom. Um, uh, they managed to break his hold on a, uh, uh, a rack of chamber pots, drag him out into the street, and then I will let the young diplomat take over. There was one, he was standing in the street at the time, this 20-something year old, who I feel a little close to. There was one terrific howl of fury, he wrote, back to Washington, I could see that something or somebody was on the ground in the center of the crowd just before the gates. And when a man disentangled himself from the crowd and rushed howling by me with a severed hand from which the blood was dripping, the thumb of which he had stuck in his mouth, I knew that the assassination of the president was accomplished. Behind him came other men with the feet, the other hand, the head, and other parts of the body displayed on the poles, each one followed by a mob of screaming men and women. Now it should be said in defense of this mob in morning coats, that this president had been responsible for the murder of about 300 of their sons uh, who he had imprisoned, sons of the elite. Uh, so they were quite angry. The Americans, uh, th this fellow, this diplomat, wrote a cable back to Washington, mom invaded French delegation, took out president, killed and dismembered him. A really, you, you, you know, you serve in the diplomatic service to write a cable like that. <laughs> and uh, it came back, State Department desires American forces to be landed in Port-au-Prince and American and foreign interests be protected. Now I mentioned earlier the, you know, what one of those interests was, which was the debt, which had been imposed after the Haitian Revolution, uh, was in arrears. National City Bank, now City, City Bank, uh, had taken it over. Uh, so in part, that, that occupation, as I had to explain to a New York Times fact checker, who said, what is the source for this? Um, in part, that, that occupation certainly was, was uh, uh, undertaken uh, to uh, start the debt payments going again. It was also taken because, if you remember the map, Haiti lies athwart the Windward Passage, 
Uh, we were talking about 1915 during World War One. The Germans had significant interest in the Caribbean. Um, they worried, the Americans worried that they would perhaps seize control of Haiti. So there were a number of different, the Panama Canal was just being uh, completed. Um, so there were a number of different factors, but one was certainly, uh, was certainly the debt. The Americans stayed 20 years. They produced a number of things, uh, including a supposedly depoliticized army, uh, which became the uh, uh, decider of power uh, up until just about the present. Uh, they produced a few agronomic schools, a law school, they built some bridges which now they strewn in ruin around the country, but mostly they produced a rekindled nationalism, noirism, uh, black nationalism. The return of the whites had been a great nightmare of Haitian history, uh, and out of this uh, uh, generation of politicized young men uh, came Dr. Francois Duvalier, a fascinating man. Um, Oops, that is out of order, but that's the border between the Dominican Republic and Haiti. Um, I should say that during this entire time, uh, in the countryside, while the elite were struggling for power among themselves and killing one another, one another off, you had a continued, continual division of land and impoverishment of the countryside. Land was divided equally among uh, children, so the plots got smaller and smaller. There was no investment, and the elite basically fled the countryside. The system is referred to commonly as pese souce. You know those um, ice, uh, little ice treats that are in plastic, and you, you squeeze it, and the icicle comes forward. That's the, that's pese souce in Creole. A squeeze and suck. Squeeze and suck. So the elite squeezed and sucked, squeezed and sucked through extortionate taxes, through taxing imports. You name it, there is a panoply of techniques by which uh, the few extract the money from the many. It still, uh, it still goes on. Um, Duvalier, I said, was a noirist, a black nationalist, fascinating figure, brilliant man in his way. He was educated in part at the Mich University of Michigan School of Public Health. Um, in part of a program by which the U.S. Marines were determined to create democracy by building a middle class, a great lesson in unintended consequences of American power, which we all should remember. Of course, I guess he might have come to Berkeley, uh, but he did not. He believed that uh, what must come to power and save Haiti was a representative individual, that is a black individual, a descendant of peasants emerging from the matrix of the history of his race. Um, came to power in 1957 at the end of another very bloody conjuncture during which five presidents held power and a major massacre was uh, effected in the slums by which several thousand people were killed by uh, the army. When he took power uh, as a result of an election, uh, his two major opponents did not recognize his election. And this is a continual theme of Haitian history. So they started invading, undermining the state, sabotage, etc. And Duvalier, uh, as his chief of staff said, uh, he faced two alternatives. This is his army chief of staff. He would, on one hand, he would be incapable of ruling, and in three or six to six months, he would fail. In the other, he, the other alternative was to make his rule perennial, to make it the rule of a single class. So it was decided, therefore, to oppose the terrorism of those trying to overthrow him with the terrorism of the state. That is a very self-serving explanation for Duvalier, obviously, but not entirely untrue. He affected what's come to be known as the fascism of underdevelopment, among other things. Uh, his method became clear very quickly. He revealed himself as a kind of political genius and absolutely ruthless. Political opponents, uh, he would not only kill, he would kill their families, he would kill their uh, uh, extended families. The bodies would be left in the street uh, for days, sometimes weeks at a time as a warning. Uh, the period throughout the early 60s saw uh, periods of crisis, one after another, in which the sirens would rage, uh, the capital would be blacked out, you would hear machine gun fire, bodies left in the streets, whole families massacred. Um, he would crush any initiative, co-opt all independent power, even if it was supposedly loyal to him, destroy not only the, the adversaries but their friends um, and allies. Indepo independent power itself was anathema. 
Um, and all of this was affected by a group critical to Haiti's politics today, known as, I'm sure you've heard of them, the Tantan Bakut. I think we have pictures. Uh, there is Duvalier Papaga with Haile Selassie. Um, there's this main street in Port Prince named for Haile Selassie, black white nationalist, great triumph when he visited uh, Haiti. Uh, couple there. He wore very often a bowler hat. It affected the image of Baron Samdi, which is a voodoo loa, a voodoo saint of the graveyard of death. Um, anyway, the Tonton Marcout. Whoops, there's. We're, uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Where are the Tonton mm -hmm. Marcout? Ah, no? Oh my. You left out the Tonton Makut. Well, I'm so sorry. <laughs> what can I say? Um, the Tonton Makut were this enormous militia. Uh, they were drawn from the slums. Uh, Leslie Moniga, who I quoted before, called them the true lumpen proletariat, pawn susceptible of manipulation in electro electoral periods and a source of shock troops for much violence, mob violence in moments of crisis and unrest. So you have in Haiti this enormous population, completely illiterate, absolutely dirt poor, I mean starving. Duvalier gathered many of them together and created his own militia. He called it the Volontier de Sécurité Nationale, the ESN, uh, otherwise known as Tonton Makou. Tonton Makou is the dad, the bogeyman who comes and steals kids. Uh, so that was a popular name. This was an amalgam of popular militia, religious sect, mass organization, uh, secret police, protection, racket, and terrorist leader. Absolutely ruthless, no idea how many there were. It could be in the tens of thousands. Some estimate range, estimates range up into the high tens of thousands, which is to say nearly 100,000 throughout the country. They were not paid. That is, they were called volunteers, volunteers of national security. Duvalier simply handed them the gun so they could go out, take things. Uh, they preyed on the country. Um, and uh, Duvalier said of them, the Makuts have but one soul, Duvalier, no but one master, Duvalier, struggle for but one destiny, Duvalier in power. Uh, they were often voodoo priests, they were often chef de section, that's to say uh, sheriffs in the countryside. Um, they preyed also on the uh, mulatto elite. Uh, it was his way of basically removing the army as the determining factor in national life, uh, destroying the threat of the coup d'etat. Um, as one of his leading uh, Ivalurists said of the Makuts, a good Makut stands ready to kill his children, children to kill their parents. Um, so through the Makuts, among other things, he made himself a lord and master. This is one of the occasions where uh, where repression, incredible repression, uh, replaces instability completely. Um, in the late 60s, at a point, I mean, he gave amazing speeches. If you want, if you're interested in this period, I recommend the comedians, Graham Greene, who gives a sort of wonderful, heart-stopping picture of that period. Uh, hard to darken that night, as he said in his introduction, uh, warning people who thought he might be exaggerating that this, in fact, was uh, didn't do justice to the truth. Uh, at the height of his power, uh, Duvalier told the crowd, I'm here to continue the tradition of Dessalines and Toussaint, in other words, black nationalism. I'm the personification of the Haitian fatherland. No foreigner is going to tell me what to do. Bullets and machine guns are incapable of daunting or touching Duvalier. I am already an immaterial being. So you have an enormous amount of apocalyptic language, blood will flow in Haiti like a river, the land will burn from north to south, there will be no sunrise, no sunset, just one great flame licking the sky, there will be a Himalaya of corpses, the dead will be buried under a mountain of ashes, it will be the greatest slaughter in history. He laughed. <laughs> he did it. He killed about 40,000 is the best estimate. Um, at the very height of his power, this picture appeared in the paper, the state newspaper, with Jesus Christ. It was kind of a composite. Jesus Christ was standing behind Duvalier with his hands placed on Papa Doc's shoulders. I have chosen him, was the, was the uh, caption. And the sign flashing over the Capitol said, I am the Haitian flag, one and indivisible, Francois Duvalier. 
Um, anyway, uh, a fascinating um, period. But one thing that should be said about this revolution of his, he'd installed many, many blacks in power, including in the low but very violent power of the Tonton Macus, but it didn't alter the basic two world system. That is to say, uh, the mulattoes, many of them fled, many of the former elite fled, those who weren't killed, but eventually they came to a kind of concordat with Duvalier. In exchange for their, for their depolitization, uh, they stayed in the country and they made money. And the squeeze and suck system uh, basically continued. Uh, he died in 71 and he put his son in power. His son was a famously stupid, uh, his classmates <laughs> knew, knew him as tête panier, basket hand. <laughs> uh, and uh, he put his son uh, in power. Uh, by this time, uh, the World Bank estimated when uh, he took power, there had been 20, 30 uh, millionaire families from Duvalier and Pop Doctors gave power. Now there were about 200. So the wealth was spread a little bit. Uh, but the son took power. The same picture was run, by the way, as the former one with Jesus Christ. But now Papa Doc is in the same position, and uh, it says, I have chosen him. Same lines. Um, as someone told me, I love this quote, pointing the son was, in a way, the old man's last thumb in everybody's eye. You know, all of them, the generals, the priests, the elite, had thought of him as a joke, this country doctor. But he had mashed them, smashed them, killed them, destroyed them all. And finally, when only he stood there and nobody dared challenge him, this was his way of rubbing their nose in it. Because what was Duvalier really saying in picking this fat, stupid kid? No one can touch me in death. Watch, even in dying, I will force you to take this. This boy is your ruler and you will accept him. Okay. We're in the reign of Papa of Baby Doc. Um, this is the famous point in his, I mean, basically the country opened up considerably under the sun. Suddenly you had dealings with the Americans who began giving a great deal of aid in exchange for a rather more regular police state. Um, by 1981, Haiti's budget, foreign aid was, was more than Haiti's budget. Uh, so he was able to negotiate with the Americans a great deal of aid. Various aid fl programs flowed into the country uh, in an effort to make Haiti the Taiwan of the Caribbean, the famous quote of the time, which meant starting assembly factories in the capital and establishing free trade zones. Um, uh, basically, agriculture, which was collapsing because of the degradation of the land, sent thousands and thousands of very, very poor peasants into the, into the cities. They tried to soak them up with these little factories that were producing, putting together um, softballs. Haiti became the United States' major producer of softballs, which meant, in essence, these planes flew in the leather, the stuffing, everything. Haitians sat at their tables, Haitian women mostly, put them together, sewed them up, and they flew out again. Uh, so basically, they were flying in to get these companies to get a salary of a dollar a day, uh, which they could pay, uh, which they could pay Haitians. Um, this is the marriage of Michelle Bennett, in which Baby Doc committed his major error, error of marrying the uh, very mulatto elite that his father had fought against. Um, during this time, the migration accelerated. Uh, the industrial parks sprung up near the airport until you had about 60,000 Haitians, uh, very poor Haitians, working in this job, in these jobs. Planes flew in and out of Jay, bringing parts of bras, parts of radios, uh, parts of softballs. So the, the, the Black Republic, uh, the first successful slave revolution in history, was on its way to becoming the major supplier of softballs and cheap brassiers uh, for the American market. Um, he was overthrown in 1986. And we go from the period of Duvalier. Uh, that was a complicated, uh, it was either a coup d'etat that brought him down by the Russian military. Uh, in an attempt to save the system, or the beginning of a revolution. And on the disagreement about that, the history of the present age depends. Uh, there are the Duvaliers with a familiar figure. Uh, this represented the Pope's visit, represented a great moment in the regime, and also the beginning of the end. Uh, because part of the, the movement against him was situated in the T.A. Leeds, the little church, Revolution Theology Church, of which 
There's Michelle again, very lovely. Spent lots of money. They stole probably upward of five hundred million dollars. Uh, although he says no. Uh, actually, after the earthquake, Jean Claude wrote a letter. He's in exile in France, but divorced now, offering to give six million to Haiti for earthquake uh, uh, relief, which must have caused Haitians a lot of amusement. Oh, let's go. Ah, okay. This is a list of uh, rulers since the fall of Dubai. There you'll see Francois at the top, who ruled for 14 years, then his son, 15, uh, and then a succession. Uh, uh, that's when I arrived, Ari Nafi, Leslie Moniga, Nafi again, after coup d'etat, as you see overthrown, Prosper Avril, another general after coup d'etat, etc., etc. And finally, Jean Bertrand Aristide, who was elected uh, president uh, in 1990, uh, overthrown nine months or eight months later, replaced by a military regime. This is the civilian figurehead, General Raul Cedras, another civilian leader, another, finally brought back to the country by another American occupation, um, replaced by his deputy, René Preval. Uh, he then replaced him. Uh, he was overthrown in 2004. He had another coup d'etat, supposedly a revolution, but probably supported to some degree by the United States. Uh, and now we are, after the intervening period, when Preval was elected, he is the current president, he is the one you never see. And he was a baker who was a close aide of, uh, of Aristide. So, we're in the part of this, and I call this the age of Aristide. Uh, a remarkable, extraordinary man, a uh, very complicated man, um, who uh, is a spectacular speaker. Uh, when I saw him speak, I thought this, and this is no uh, offense in this remark, but I thought this must be what it must have been like to be in one of the big crowds around Hitler, Mussolini. Um, I'm not comparing it to them, I'm just saying that he did to crowds what you see in those old newsreels played them like, like a musical uh, instrument. Um, all right. Let me try to uh, skip, skip, skip ahead here. The legend of ours, Steve uh, goes on. He's now in exile in South Africa. Uh, but there is a sense, and I was thinking and, and putting together these remarks, that in which the present age, all of those 14 or 12 people listed here are really, in a sense, uh, under his uh, shadow. Um, after Duvalier fell, there was, as I said, a great disagreement about what did that mean? Was it a coup d'etat that the officers affected, which would save the system and deliver it to another leader through uh, an election or something? Or was it the beginning of a popular revolution? Uh, this was the argument over the deshikaj, which means the, the uprooting. Uh, in the days, and you have to think back now to Haiti's uh, slave history here, to the feeling of vulnerability of the elite as people who, whose ancestors, in effect, sat in those plantation houses surrounded by hundreds of thousands of enslaved Africans. Uh, after uh, Duvalier left the country, flew out of the country, you had a period of what might be called instability in which Makuts were found on the street and were killed. This was still, this was going on, I covered this. Um, you would have angry crowds of Haitians surrounding Tonton Makut, who was basically this guy who had taken off his uniform in civilian clothes, uh, pleading for his life. They'd surround him, uh, cover him with gasoline, uh, light him on fire. Uh, it, then his body was ripped apart. Chunks of it were carried through, triumphantly carried through the streets. These images were on television. Uh, they, you could say, are branded into the memories of the Haitian elite. Uh, RST told me, when I asked him about this, I met him at first in 1986. He was a priest at St. Jean Bosco Church, Salesian priest, amazingly charismatic figure. He used to lean in and talk to me so passionately, his head would sometimes, his forehead would sometimes hit mine, mm -hmm. uh, which was very distracting. And it was very hard to take notes. So I finally had to get a tape recorder, which I until then did not use as a reporter. I didn't want to use them. But I, I was in despair. I would come out of this long, intense conversation with him 
and I would have four words. Uh, and then the pen would go down the page, and I'd think, yeah, that's worth when you hit me in the head. <laughs> but he said to me in this period, at this time, uh, he said, I, st I said, you know, what about all these people being burned in the streets? You know, I mean, you're talking about how great this popular revolution is, but isn't this a little bit, I mean, shouldn't there be some kind of justice here? Isn't this a problem? You're a priest. And he said to me, I stood and marveled at the justice of the people. Uh, we're, we're in that place, which was then burned down, by the way, in that church. I stood and marveled at the justice of the people. I remember him still saying, and Ned Bellier, you know, that he, 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 our consciences should be, when I said, well, you know, what I just <coughs> said, isn't that a problem, popular justice? Our consciences should be clear, he said. These Makuts were Satan, Satan incarnate. We saw Satan incarnate in certain, in many of these Makuts. It was the people who suffered. And the people themselves who decided to act. And in this, they were doing uh, God's work. And this dichotomy, or, or this controversy about how to affect a change of power, how to affect a change of system. Can you do it through an election? Or RSD could and did win elections. Or that that implied certain legal limits on power? Or could you do it, or did you need to do it through a revolution? In other words, the vast division of wealth, uh, the uh, absolutely inoperative government system, the government that exists to essentially steal from the country, how do you change that? How do you go about changing it? Is, it could any election <laughs> run by the present elite put in power somebody who would actually threaten their interests. This is a paradox that's loomed over the last 25 years of Haitian history. Uh, RSD was very clear about this as a priest before he became a political candidate. Hallelujah for men and women in Haiti do, who do not join forces with the malevolent regime. Hallelujah for the Haitians who do not enter into the gluttonous pillaging by, by a band of the bloodthirsty, and whose midst brother sells brother. Hallelujah, because the path of those Haitians who respect the regime, who reject the regime, is the path of righteousness and love. And this is what the Lord requires. They said this in the cathedral in Port-au-Prince. Um, they tried to kill him seven times is the legend. Uh, a lot of his history is legendary. The man came up the first time, the revolver, aimed it at him, point blank range in the church, didn't fire. Uh, eventually took it and took the bullets out and handed it, them to him. Several other times he was fired at point blank, uh, didn't hit him, missed him. This became very quickly a legend in the country. Um, in any event, during a period of, he, he was extremely eloquent about the poor, the conditions of the country. His writing is beautiful, his uh, sermons are incredible. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of examples of, of his speech and then try to. Uh, wind up and get to, I'm sorry, I've, I've talked too long, um, but wind up and get to questions. He said, I was at Quad de Buseo, this is an area outside the capital, it was raining. Under the rain and the filthy, foul mud, the cart haulers, wet from the water of the heavens, soaking in muddy sweat, continued without respite their black slave labor. Cart haulers, tragic Sisyphean figures condemned to carry eternally in their arms the weight of the suffering of this world of repression. I used to walk through La Saline, this is one of the beetle wheels that slums have collapsed, um, that are spreading like contagion in our city, and for years, uh, that for years have been clogged with the detritus of the deadly economic infection called capitalism. There are many dark byways, paths that run between two rows of shanties made of plywood and cardboard and old disintegrating tin. One bright, bright hot day, I walked down one of these corridors, a dark byway, even in the hot Haitian sun, and at the end, I found a courtyard with three naked children, my country's new generation, bathing in a puddle of garbage, left from the rains of the night before. On another day, I walked down another corridor and three young girls, wearing secondhand dresses thrown away by nice middle-class girls in a northern country, and bought there by a profiteering middleman, means the United States. These young girls were selling themselves for quarters and dimes and less to any man, and that was the new generation of my beloved country. Can we continue to find normal the situation of violence imposed on the poor? So he was a liberation theology priest who became a political candidate. His slogan was in part, La Revolution n'est pas fini. The revolution is not uh, finished. He said of the Americans, 
what they did was bring about the departure of their puppet dictator in order to avoid a social cyclone. Uh, they wanted to promote a kind of devaluing of the human face, thus accelerating change in order to change as little as possible. In other words, the overthrow of Duvalier was just in order to make way for another. Um, a great irony of this story is, and I can't do justice, I'm afraid, uh, to uh, the story of how he eventually came to power, but when he led the Lavalas movement, Lavalas means avalanche, um, uh, which is an image again calculated to uh, uh, send terror through the Haitian elite, this idea of uh, an avalanche of poor people taking over avalanche. It actually, the word comes from uh, the water that runs through the slums uh, when it rains in Haiti. Um, lava loss, avalanche, or flood. Uh, his name was called the flood. Um, you who have plotted against me, you who have plotted against the Haitian people, Bishop Romero, Bishop, he's denouncing the bishops, let me look you in the eye. Please don't be ashamed. I have come to tell you I love you too. The church is rich, thanks to us, the poor, who have agreed to be part of one sole body. Alone we are weak. Together we are strong. Together we are the flood. Let the flood descend. The flood of poor peasants and poor soldiers. The flood of the poor jobless multitudes. So his language uh, is frankly revolutionary. Uh, the amazing thing, and it's a part of greater history than that of Haiti, or larger history, it has to do with the end of the Cold War, among other things. The great irony is the United States, in essence, made it possible for him to come to power by election. Uh, he never could have otherwise. The United States imposed uh, a free election in 1990. And then the question is pre presented to Haiti, as it is to all of us, what are elections exactly anyway? We have this idea a kind of mythical idea about elections that on a given day, everyone in the country comes together and they have the same amount of power. One, everybody, the rich mulatto with his factory and his millions and the absolutely poor starving peasant, they each have one, one, one vote. But of course, that's a complete myth. They don't have the same amount of power. So when Father Aristide won 66%, 68% of the vote, in fact, everyone who had any power in the country virtually uh, was on was in the 33 percent. That is, was in the other side, and he was pre presented uh, with the challenge that every Haitian has, the, as the uh, president has, when he reaches the palace and the fauteuil, the presidential chair. Now that you're in the presidential chair, how do you take power? Aristide um, struggled to do that for nine months. In 1991. Uh, there was a coup uh, staged against him, actually before he actually took power, uh, which resulted in the people flooding out into the street. A great many people were burned to death, among other things. A great many, I say, probably scores of people were burned to death. The Papal Nuncio was pulled out into the street, stripped and humiliated. Uh, this was the Lava Lost movement. Uh, mobs stormed, stormed the Nuncio. Um, they sacked and burned the Nunciatura. Uh, they sacked the house of the interior minister, um, they humiliated the archbishop, they killed a great many uh, people, uh, and this was in response to the attempted coup d'etat before he took power. Those events, um, here's a brief picture of it, barricades were spaced at 20 meter intervals, some very high, others feeding strong fires and support fronts. The population in a terrified state refuses passage. Delma is dark with smoke, people, barricades, uh, the house of the apostolic nuncio is burning, on Nassau Street an apocalyptic scene waits for us. We count six burned corpses, the horror mounts. Eight dismembered bodies lie in the streets. Former partisans of the Makutu tribe to take power did not escape the pure fury of popular education. They were slaughtered with knives and pikes. Some were eviscerated, others emasculated. Before our horrified eyes, a taxi driver with passengers inside the car drives over the bodies. This was just before our seat took power. Um, so, these images, needless to say, loomed over his presidency. Uh, he was overthrown uh, about eight months later uh, and taken uh, eventually to the United States. The Clinton administration brought him back uh, in 1994 to finish off his term. Uh, but the administration, that particular occupation, which I may picture of. There he is, ministering to the poor. Um, 
There he is brought back to the country with an American soldier, um, speaking at the UN. And there's the border again. Uh, that's the border with the Dominican Republic. Um, so we are still, it seems to me, in the age of our steed. Uh, he is in exile now, having been overthrown a second time um, uh, in 2004 by a coup that was partly backed by parts, I would say, of the U.S. Well, Americans in any event. How closely they were connected to the government remains a matter of dispute. Um, but by that time, he had lost the chunk of the elite, a large part of the chunk of the elite who had supported him. Um, he to try to solve that political puzzle, how do you rule? How do you prevent an overthrow? And how do you affect real political change without putting weapons in the hands of your en enemies who will never admit your legitimacy? Uh, he failed that test. It may in part be true that he failed it because he wasn't willing to be as violent as he could have been. I have said this before in Haiti and gotten a very angry response from people. Uh, but. Uh, when he was first overthrown, the crowds wanted to bring him back to the palace on their shoulders, essentially, and he refused to do it. He feared there would be too much death. Um, but he's a leader who probably should have come to power through a revolution. Uh, instead, he came to power through an election. And we now uh, have a government that is run by his, originally his aide, René Pregal, who uh, was originally a baker, a very quiet man, doesn't like it. He's the opposite of RST in many ways doesn't like to appear publicly, uh, is not a very forceful individual. He's been working with the American administration quite collaboratively these past couple of years. They put in place a very good trade bill, among other things, opening up American markets uh, to Haitian goods. But it seems to me that the figure of RSD looms over the country. He still stands uh, as a kind of image and myth of liberation. Um, uh, and the countryside continues eroding. Uh, this is a tent city in the midst of a bidonville, Tinkan City, which I believe is La Saline, which is uh, where our speed, where his church was located. The church was burned down. It was attacked during one of his sermons. Thirteen people were killed by Makuts, uh, stabbed uh, uh, and shot, and the church was then burned down. Um, this is the uh, the Bidonville, many buildings of which, they're not really buildings, many of them were just thrown together shacks, but many of them collapsed. And now you see this image of uh, these tents, tent cities in the middle. And the question now is whether, it seems to me, when hundreds of millions, perhaps billions of dollars, flow into Haiti to remake Haiti, just as Haiti was going to be remade in 1804, after the revolution, 1915, after the first occupation, uh, 1986, when I first visited in the fall of Duvalier, 1990, when Aristide was first elected, uh, 94, when he returned, 2000, when he was re-elected. Once, once again, now we're talking about the remaking of Haiti. Uh, it's unclear where all that money will go. I've advocated in the New York Times that some control should be put in place so it at least goes into the hands of ordinary Haitians. So those who build back the houses that have fallen are Haitian workers, Haitian electricians, uh, Haitian masons, uh, and Haitian contractors, uh, not simply members of the elite who will send the money back abroad. Whether or not this will happen, I don't know, but I know that the language, the remaking, the rebuilding, building it back better, everything I hear makes me cringe because I feel the echoes, the echoes uh, from Haitian history. Um, but on the other hand, I suppose one has to remember Clinton's words about the patience and resiliency of the people and where they derive it and hope that this remaking is different than all the others. Thank you very much.
third part of the question, is there any remedy to this problem of deforestation in particular I think Makai, I think is the name of the Kenyan woman who received the Nobel Prize 20 years ago uh, and did a lot for, uh, for Kenya. Uh, well, the answer to the first question is yes, deforestation is, although cause, as I tried to suggest here, uh, is, is a difficult word. The question is, you know, deforestation, what is that caused by? And I would argue what that's caused by is the two world system I tried to describe, the poverty of the countryside, the division of land holdings, the extortion of taxes, the exhaustion of the soil, uh, the, all of that leading to the peasants increasingly cutting down trees, which they not only sell but use for charcoal. Charcoal, when you look at those, um, those uh, you know, deal, is the cooking, the fuel that's used for cooking. So Aristide's description of that man, slave-like, in the rain, pulling the huge cart, that is a huge cart of charcoal. These enormous bags of charcoal are pulled, you know, they labor like beasts, as he said, to pull these enormous, and that is, those are the trees that are coming in from the countryside, chopped down by cousins, made into charcoal, coming into the slums to fuel the cooking fires. Um, so it's, you could say a cause, but it's really a symptom of something of something else. Uh, replanting their enormous, I mean, Haiti is great, as I wrote in the Times of the several people mad, the petri dish, the petri dish of development work. You know, I mean, every organization is there. I think there are more uh, or development organizations per capita than anywhere in the world. And um, a lot of them are working, God bless them, in planting trees. Uh, they do that. The problem is, and, and there's been a lot of accomplished on that score. Uh, and I hope some money in the rebuilding will go into reforestation. But the fact is, until the underlying economic causes are confronted, people will continue to cut down trees because it's an easy resource. It's needed for fuel. Uh, and it is the fact that it is so necessary uh, is an expression of the poverty uh, of Haiti. So I, I always find it's difficult, you know, cause and effect. You know, uh, Duvalier, was he the cause of much suffering in Haiti? Yes, but he was, in effect, uh, a product of Haitians' political, of Haiti's political uh, uh, dysfunction as well. But so, can you call it a free market in the sale of charcoal, or is it a dominated market by a certain class or a certain group? Um, well, it's a good question. Uh, free market. No, is it something uh, about that who's not a rich person? Well, uh, mostly it's a, you know, mostly what I call Gwoneg, uh, big, big man in the countryside, tend to have this as a business. But it's spread out. Now, the whole business, I mean, Haiti's economy is fascinating. I encourage people here who are interested in the study, go and study it. Because if you look at the World Bank figures, the World Bank will tell you, Haiti has 80% unemployment. Wow, 80%? That is high. And then, and then you think about that for a minute, or 75%, but at least some of you You think about that for a minute and think, well, so what do all those people do? I mean, you're talking about four and five, and of course, that says more about unemployment statistics than it says about unemployment or people without jobs. I mean, people work. They work in the slums. They work, and those people are counted as unemployed, but they work like dogs. You know, that guy who we pictured pulling the charcoal, he's probably unemployed for the world now. So we're talking here about two worlds when it comes to statistics, two worlds when it comes to looking at the economy. The economy of Haiti, is a wonderful book called The Political Economy of Haiti, that if you're interested in this question, I, I highly recommend to you. It's this guy whose name I'm going to say escapes me at the moment, an English uh, economist who went into the slums, uh, into the Beatleville, and did this amazing study of the economy there. It's a, it is a brilliant book, and um, it, goes, it gets into the questions you're asking. I really applaud you for all this significant information that you brought to this table, especially like, you know, really people understanding and knowing the history of the country and Haitian people. And you mentioned this question of the first successful slave rebellion ever, you know, in the face of the world. You know, and I really, uh, you know, am very happy that this question comes because in the ma mainstream media, you don't see that much, you don't hear that much. And I read your article as well. I would like to add to, you know, something that I think, you know, is you, did, you, you actually spoke to that, but you didn't elaborate that much about. And I see, there's a title, Why is Haiti so poor? Mm -hmm. And I think it's significant to really understand, you spoke about the role that the French colonialism played and how United States actually became the army to making sure that the Haitian people pay those debt of the reparation right. and fin finally stealing all the golds and putting it at the city bank that we are actually talking about. 
but also it continues to today. You know, I'm actually a you know, volunteer for Revolution, Revolution newspaper. I really encourage people to get a hold of. The role that the United States has played, you know, since the inception, since their actual connection with Haiti, has been oppressing the people to the max right. with the best of their ability possible. You, uh, I, I think the question, I'm I'm that in one second, I'm, so just ask question yeah, I would like to actually like speak to that question because you spoke about a lot about of you. different governments changed, but the role of the army and the relationship that United the city actually played to keeping that you know bloodthirsty army right. in power okay. still exists today. So you're Thank asking you. about the, the role of the United States. And today what the US role yeah. is in that sure. I okay. Thank you. Well the first thing I'd say I talked a lot, obviously a lot about the history. I talked a lot more in, in uh, uh, the pieces collected in this in this book, Spooky Ground Body. So if you want more about the history more, I'm conscious of course of everything I left out, which is everything. But um, uh, <coughs> But, this, but that was a sketch. I'm, I must confess to you that I always uh, feel, and I feel it now, a kind of twinge when somebody starts to say, you know, the United States is, I mean, look at what it did to Haiti. I mean, that is the true story. Um, the United States did a lot of, uh, in its foreign policy, did a lot of very harmful things to Haiti, beginning with, well, not even beginning with, but most obviously at the beginning, uh, the isolation of Haiti, the refusal to recognize uh, Haiti's independence, in which it should be said it was joined by all of Europe and sure. all and Bolivar and you know you name it. I mean Haiti, it, the U.S. was not its friend, but no one else was either. Uh, so one should say that I feel a kind of twinge because I feel, in a sense, it takes the story of Haiti, which is complicated, in which in which the United States, France, and other countries have played very important roles, but it takes it and makes the U.S. role the main thing in its history, which it isn't. It just isn't. Uh, the United States, uh, the occupation, which lasted for 20 years, uh, was a very uh, mixed uh, blessing. You're talking about development. I mean, you could just say, well, it was an occupation, it's terrible, and denounce it completely. Absolutely. But if you want to talk about what happened to the country during that time, one thing that happened was the country was centralized. That is this huge conurbation of Port-au-Prince, which you see now, two million people. That really began under the American occupation. The notion that Marines have to centralize the country needs to be modernized. Uh, they, the Marines uh, built, one way or another, a lot of roads, a lot of infrastructure. Much of it lies in ruins now. They did do that. Some of it with forced Haitian labor, which, you know, politically speaking, was not the most intelligent thing to do, considering the history of the country. Uh, that is, white Marines presiding over Haitian work gangs, uh, echoes, obviously very good echoes of slavery. There was a revolt uh, led by Charlemagne Corral, famous figure in Haitian history, against the Marines. Uh, they eventually tracked him down and killed him. Uh, famous picture of him nailed to a door, Christ-like. Uh, so the occupation, it also trained, you know, the Marine ideology at the time, the U.S. Marines, the U.S. State Department, the United States remembered during this, these years, which you learned about in social studies as the years of isolation, you know, between the world wars, the United States, the years of isolation, the U.S. during those isolated years had occupied the Dominican Republic, Haiti, Nicaragua, Cuba, what am I leaving? Am I leaving anything out already? Philippines, obviously. Uh, Philippines. Um, Not so much different today. <laughs> it wasn't that isolated, uh, the United States. And during those years, the Marines had a certain ideology, part of which was, you know, these countries, they only have an elite and a vast number of poor. There's no middle class. How can we build a middle class here? How can we build political stability? Which they did want to build. There's no question about that. They wanted political stability one way or another. You can argue it was puppets of the Americans or whatever, but they wanted, they didn't want to have to intervene again because of uh, that uh, kind of destabilization. Again, you can argue with that. The ideology was, uh, we're going to produce a middle class. So they sent great numbers of people to school for agronomy, to school for uh, dentistry, to school for uh, medicine, law, and tried to build this sort of white collar middle class in which they thought that democracy, or at least a stable government, democracy is going too far, but some kind of political stability could be built. And as I said during my uh, presentation, that Duvalier is, you know, in a sense, a kind of uh, uh, really an example of exactly what they supposedly were trying to achieve. And it shows the law of unintended consequences when you use your power and think you can do it, uh, uh, as it were, uh, without, you can, you can do it without casting a shadow. 
the shadow of your power, which causes nationalism. Instead, you can do it with a scalpel. You can alter the society. You can change things. You know, we saw the same phenomenon, obviously not the same, but in Iraq. You know, this notion that you can simply reshape things. American power, very strong, you can redo it. But <coughs> your own power, your own shadow, has this enormous counter effect, not surprisingly. So, you know, the United States' role in Haitian history uh, is very often not positive. I am not, you know, I talked about both the occupation and um, uh, Jean-Claude Duvalier's regime during which the U.S. started putting a lot of money into Haiti. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, it floated, uh, it, it fed a lot of people. It gave 60,000 people in the capital jobs working in these assembly plants, which probably uh, fed 600,000 people. Uh, now, Aristide, when you know, I described the assembly plants, when I was talking to him about them, again, his face was right against mine. And, and he said, you know, I said I was out at these assembly plants, I was watching you know, these women, they're only making three dollars a day, that's terrible, but on the other hand, you know, that's a lot of money actually from you know as a, as a salary compared to what most people are getting. And uh, he said, you know, all right, you know, if you had to do this, if, if these American companies had to have these things sewed in, in uh, Chinatown in New York. He said, um, it would cost $40 a day. And here it costs $3 a day. Tell me what the difference is. And I, and I knew I was about to get blasted. And I said, I don't know what the difference is. And he leaned in and bucked me on the forehead again <laughs> and said, the difference is our blood, like that. And uh, you know, yeah, it is. You know, I mean, those companies are profiting off the poverty. That is the industry. The industry is. Uh, uh, incredibly poor people who can sell their labor incredibly cheaply. Should it not happen? Probably not. Is there another step to get to get those people money? Maybe. We can argue about development. But um, under Jean-Claude, you know, you go to Haiti now and people talk, I hate to say this, about the Jean-Claude regime with nostalgia. Amazing, because there at least was some degree of political stability and some money flowing into the country from tourism, uh, from investment and foreign aid. Um, is Haiti now, or is the United States now trying to take over Haiti? Uh, are they occupying the airport to prevent our Steve from coming back? No, I don't, I don't think they are. I think the United States Army is doing what the United States Army does, and I've covered the United States Army a lot. It comes in and immediately sees to security. That's its first concern. So the big story of the first week of the American Army's presence was, why aren't they feeding people? They're, they're only flying in more troops. Well, that's what the US Army does. And one of the terrible things, I think, shown by this earthquake most recently, but it's shown again and again in recent history, is that there should be some form of intervention machinery after natural disasters brought under the UN auspices that can do these things. The US Army shouldn't be the one in control of that situation. Um, it shouldn't. But uh, do I think the story of Haiti is the story of American depredation? And that's what we're seeing several hundred miles off the American coast? Uh, I don't. I think that the United States policy has very often been detrimental to Haiti. But I also think Haitians should not be deprived of their own history, which they have made. Uh, it isn't only uh, the US and, the Fran and France who made Haitian history. Um, so that's an answer that will, will not uh, make me happy. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, um, I believe that they're importing the subsidized rice. Can you stand up? Um, okay. um, I believe that they're importing, like a lot of uh, small countries, the subsidized agricultural products in the U.S. and that has led to the collapse of the, uh, you know, small farms and such. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on that. And the other thing is, sure. um, the I want, what is the status of contraception in Haiti? I'm really interested to know. I'm sorry, the, the status. What is the status, status of contraception? Of contraception? Yeah, because I'm wondering if the fact that there is a heavy Catholic presence means that you know it has been difficult for people to get access to proper family planning. I know that um, Joya Mukherjee from Partners in Health was saying that they really need to get an army of community workers to go out and. and um, the public health issues and maternal health issues. Right. Um, okay, well, those are two uh, very good and, and both of them quite complicated questions. Um, the whole story of aid and the way imported food 
has undermined Haiti's economy uh, is a lurid and rather disgusting one. It also says a lot about development. Um, uh, I talked about the develop, you know, the period under Jean-Claude when American aid stuff came in, flooding in. Some of it from the American government, a lot of it money from the American government that, flood, that uh, went to NGOs, non-governmental organizations. Um, during that time, one of the things that was imported in great amounts was flour. Excuse me, wheat, sorry. This came from the American government. You know, when you read the U.S. gave Haiti 120 million last year. What, you know, there's a list of things that are under that number. And one of them will be 50 million in wheat. And actually what this is is bags of wheat that the government has stored somewhere, surplus wheat, that they ship to Haiti. And they say, now we gave them $50 million. Um, that wheat went to uh, La Minoterie, which is the, the government uh, flour mill. It was milled into flour. Uh, and Duvalier personally took, I think, something like $3 a bag for it. It was supposed to be sold at concessionary rates you know, basically given away in the marketplace. Instead, it became this very, very rich source uh, of, of graft, mm -hmm. as a lot of the foreign aid did, by the way. Uh, now, to get to your question, it, it had the secondary effect. So you had this stuff that was actually, became quite expensive, uh, and it was another source of pese su se, you know, squeeze and suck. Um, at the same time, the wheat coming in undermined Haiti's main staple crop, which was rice. Uh, produced uh, largely in the Artibonite Valley. Uh, long history of this. There's no history of eating bread in Haiti. It's, it's rice is the staple. And in a relatively small amount of time, uh, these uh, still cheap imports destroyed a lot of rice farmers. Uh, so that is absolutely true. Now, the current situation, what you're talking about now, the importation of cheap rice, I'm sure is not doing much good for the rice farms, but it should be said the country desperately needs food. Um, the planting season has not yet begun. Uh, so I'm not giving you a specific answer to the current imports. Um, one of the things that has to happen if there's going to be a recovery is that the agricultural sector has to be bolstered very, very quickly so there can be planting. Uh, and one hopes so that some of those people who fled Puerto Press, very large numbers left, you know, uh, which is a good thing, actually join their family members in the countryside, one would like the agricultural sector to be enriched to, so that those people could be housed and you know, to reverse that migration I talked about that happened during the 70s and 80s of people from the dying farms to the slums, you know, to the Vido Vido. Uh, one would like it to go back the other way. The, the question about contraception, I'm not uh, qualified really to, to answer. You're asking a very specific question. Um, uh, you know, Haitians in the countryside tend to have fairly large families, not least because of the incredible infant mortality rates. And I gave you maternal mortality rates. The infant mortality rates are, are horrendous. They're the worst in the hemisphere, some of the worst uh, in the world. And, you know, this is a sort of a uh, law of development that, that, you know, birth numbers tend to be high. Uh, in very poor countries, particularly in the countryside, uh, not simply for because of lack of contraception or perhaps the Catholic influence. Although I would tell you that um, countryside is much less Catholic than Voodoo. Catholicism and Voodoo coexist in Haiti. It's a fascinating subject, also, which I talk about in the book, which um, I didn't have a chance to get into here. But uh, you know, the Catholic influence in the countryside and contraception. I'm, I'm simply. Uh, not sure. I would think it would have more to do uh, with simple lack of access, not an ideological message not to use it. Uh, obviously, those things back to the issue of cause. Those there is no you, know, you can't identify cause and effect there. But anyway, I'm sorry not to be able to give you a better answer. Yes, sir. If you were the president of me, what would you do? <laughs> <laughs> That's an easy question. <laughs> I would leave immediately. <laughs> Well, I think, you know, you, you, I, you know, I was looking at you before and didn't call on your thought. You have an awful question, I can tell you. Awful simple question. Uh, you know, I tried to describe the dynamic uh, that uh, exists in Haiti, which is this incredible political churning. Uh, and the reality that once you get to the, the palace, you immediately have to defend your position in it. 
uh, and uh, you are immediately almost always under some kind of threat um, by people who don't rec recognize your legitimacy. And this, is, by the way, is, and I should have said this, you know, the Lava Loss Movement, I, I forgot to, neglected to say this, I'm sorry, the Lava Loss Movement has been, you know, the part of it still loyal to RST completely has been forced out of uh, the electoral realm by the current electoral council. Uh, so you have a kind of part of it that's split a couple of times, it's a complicated history, but uh, Preval has the allegiance of some of those people, but many of them, the poorest of the poor, still look to RST. They're still part of Lava Loss or consider them such, themselves to be. Um, uh, but when he got to the palace, I mean, he was a man who really did want to do what you're implying, which is to say, change the country, uh, do something about the crushing poverty, uh, raise people up, give them, you know, what part of his uh, campaign slogan was one meal a day. One meal a day. So he was saying, you know, if I'm elected, I promise that you will eat every day. Now think about that. Um, now, how do you achieve that? Well, he got into office. You know, he, one of the first things he did was he threw open the palace gates and had the poor come onto the palace grounds and he served them a meal himself. And he had the soldiers, the palace guard, do it as well. And this was an incredible thing. And this image, I, I remember seeing images of this. I wasn't there at the time thinking, oh my God, he, he's doomed, you know. He's doomed. And that idea of having the army subservient to the poor, astonishing thing. Um, now, uh, the elite will tell you, and you know, one of the interesting things about covering place for a long time is you get to know people. Uh, and I got to know a lot of intellectuals who originally supported him wholeheartedly, uh, who were lefty, they mostly been in exile in the Dominican Republic, New York, Miami, uh, Caracas. Fascinating people. The Haitian, as I said at the beginning, the Haitian elite uh, is amazing. The intellectual class, extremely impressive, very, very impressive, a lot of them, very impressive people. And they were ardent supporters of his. And then they eventually, a lot of them, turned against him. Now, they were not lackeys of the United States. Um, but uh, they thought he was turning into Dumoulin, which, I mean, you know, that, for his international supporters, and RST had a lot of sympathy in the United States and elsewhere, one of the left, mostly, um, that's an absurd charge to them. You know, my god, this guy's a liberation priest. He's on the left. How can you say he's like Dumoulin? Dumoulin was a fascist, for Christ's sake. But to the elite, they look at him and they see those thousands of poor blacks, of ex-slaves, as it were, the equivalent, current equivalent of slaves, and they say, they're just like the Makuts. You know, what's the difference? What's the difference? They're burning people in the street. What's the difference that I'm doing like? So again and again, I would hear from these people who I had known well and who backed him originally, who backed the overthrow of Duvalier. One guy in particular, a brilliant man, whose entire family had been massacred under Duvalier. Because he had been speaking on the radio in the DR against Duvalier, and Makuts came in and wiped out his entire family, raped them, to, you know, just awful, awful stuff. Occupied his house for 20 years, lived in the house. Um, he, who had backed him very strongly when I came back in 2004, said to me, you know, he became Duvalier. He became, and you know, I looked at the figures and the number of people killed and things like that, and I just said, well, you know, this doesn't seem at all comparable. And I go, ah, no, it's, he was on the verge of it. He was on the verge. So you have these certain uh, political dynamics uh, that the Haitians look through uh, that make it very hard to impose a stable regime without imposing a very repressive regime. And RST, I think, was caught to some degree in that in that conundrum. Um, but I still, as you can tell, I'm dancing, dancing, dancing around the question of what would I do as President, <laughs> President Mark Danner of Haiti. Um, <laughs> uh, and, you know, the alternative, uh, you know, I talked about the, I guess part of my answer would be to say, well, if I was president, how would I have come to power? <laughs> because if I came to power through an election, I mean, RST again had that problem. He was able to come to power through an election, in part because the United States imposed it. They said, we're going to have a fair election. So people voted, and the elite and the army certainly did not believe that they would let RST take power, this lefty communist priest, you know. I and mean, he, he was, you know, communist, maybe he's too much, but he was certainly socialist, no question about it. How would the United States do this? Uh, but they did. Uh, and then he was in the terrible position of having only the great majority of the people behind him. 
you know, which is which is true. I mean, and it, and it goes back to our whole romance about elections. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love elections. I cover elections. Thank God we have elections. But <laughs> this idea that an election can can uh, come always to a political solution, particularly in a dramatically divided country, is to some degree uh, a myth. Um, now, had he come to power in a revolution, it might have been different. In which case, we would all have, you know, this room would be full of Haitian exiles who would be screaming at me and denouncing me. It would be like after Castro. You know, you would have had, they would have exported the uh, wealthy class as Castro did. Um, instead, of course, Haiti over the last 50 years has exported the poor class uh, and the middle class um, in, in uh, various cities. But I don't, I guess the final answer to your question is, um, Probably the only way uh, to achieve some kind of nonviolent uh, progress in the Haiti is through um, an alliance with the rising middle class. And Haiti. Well, that's what, you know, Jean Claude, in, in essence, became that. Benevolent is probably overstating it, but the regime was not, you know, they killed people, they had political prisoners, but it wasn't, it wasn't hugely repressive the way his fathers had been. Uh, I certainly don't want to say benevolent dictator in this way. I, I wouldn't say that, and I don't say that. I did not say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, but the fact is that in order to achieve some kind of process, progress, there needs to be some kind of political entente uh, uh, with at least some of the powers that be. And, uh, you know, that is hard to achieve because many of them are unreconstructed. And, you know, as I tried to show, Aristide used the language of revolution and to some degree the techniques of revolution to rule in a situation where a revolution had not happened. And he was not willing to go the extra mile, or many miles, to have a revolution. I don't know whether that could have worked or not, but he wasn't willing to. Uh, so he was caught in this uh, conundrum. Uh, and now you have a regime there that's, that's very weak, uh, you know, a very politically divided country in which money is going to start to just course in, course in. And um, the political implications of that are at this point unknown. There could be political instability. The American troops could have been, again, be shooting at Haitians. It's quite possible, uh, but it hasn't happened yet. So I'm sorry not to be able to do better. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. If you, if you don't want to be president of Haiti, what if you were president of the United States? What would you do in this? <laughs> Why is everybody offering me these jobs? <laughs> I have not sought, nor will I accept. Uh, what would I do about, about Haiti? In the next five years, yeah. Well, that I, can, I think I can try to answer. Um, I would um, uh, get Haitians involved early on at the governmental level in planning and rebuilding. That is easier said than done, by the way, because uh, the government is so weak. It's both that's a difficult economic problem, by the way, in this situation, and I recognize that. But you're talking about, I'm the president, not the economist, so I'm going to tell you. Um, I would uh, ensure that uh, a lot of the raw material that was going to be used was made in Haiti. I would, one of the first things I would bring there is a cement factory. Uh, I would. Uh, insofar as possible, try to use uh, local materials, locally constructed. Um, I would decentralize the country, as I suggested earlier. I would put a lot of, make sure a lot of investment went into the agriculture sector, uh, and again, spread out. That is, to try to ensure that members of that rising middle class I spoke about don't snatch up lots of cheap land and start growing summer or winter vegetables for the U.S. market. I think they should grow winter vegetables for the U.S. market, among other things, but I think they should be on relatively on medium-sized farms, not huge ones. Um, I would ensure uh, job training, and my uh, broader goal would be to try to get enough income into the hands of as many Haitians as possible so that they could invest in small businesses. These Haitians are immensely entrepreneurial. It is an astonishing country in that way. Uh, so, insofar as you can give them surplus income, and surpl surplus is anything over a few dollars a day, uh, you are creating a pool of money that can go into smaller, uh, uh, smaller um, uh, stores and smaller businesses. Uh, so I would try to do that. 
I would try to ensure that a lot of the money that went in isn't simply shipped out into the bank accounts of the elite, who, as I say, are immensely charming and wonderful people and who the American embassy loves and hell, I love. You know? And I'm the president, so I can love <laughs> But they do tend to uh, take the cash to rebuild this building and they make a partnership with an American company and the American company gives them 100 grand, thanks for the help, the American company builds it, the 100 grand goes into a bank in uh, Zurich or uh, New York, probably now, maybe Beijing, I mean, <laughs> it goes out of the country. So you have, you see, so the question is where is this money, just if you talk about it as a pool of a billion dollars. And by the way, the other thing I'm sure is that all of these numbers being thrown around are actually materializing, you know? Because there's a long history in Haiti of, oh, we pledge 50 million. Wow, we pledge 100 million. No, 200 million. And most of the money doesn't actually ever arrive. That has happened repeatedly. As President Clinton, who's the special envoy, knows very well, he spends half his time calling up presidents and saying, hey, how about that 20 million? You know, what about it? Yeah, Mr. President, I'll, I'll do it next year. So I'd make sure a lot of that money did get there. Um, but I think, and I'd also avoid grandiloquent pronouncements about rebuilding Haiti. Uh, I think, you know, and I, and I would uh, also stay away from screwing around in Haitian politics, which is, even as I say it, seems completely visible to me since you can't when you're giving them a billion dollars. Um, but uh, I would hope that spreading money around is to spread power around, uh, and that uh, as many of those followers in Lava Loss who end up running small stores or selling things on the street or making small businesses of one kind or another. Those are people who will not in future want to burn people in the street necessarily, even if they have good reasons. Uh, so I, I don't, and finally my goals would be modest ones. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't talk about, as I said, I wouldn't talk about a building. I would talk about um, uh, helping and gradual political development there. I wouldn't cancel elections if I could avoid it. One is about to be canceled. I think it already has the next month. And I would try to have the next election. And insofar as I had influence, I would realize that our esteemed supporters are better within the political system voting than they are outside it. Uh, so I would try to deal with that in some way. I mean, of course, the conundrum there is if all of his voters can vote, they'll be reelected. Uh, and that is a conundrum for the Haitian elite. Um, but you have to find some way to get people into the political system, not even because when they're outside it, they're like a, you know, an unleashed uh, whatever that, that, that is threatening. You know, that is in, in threatening. When I say threatening, I mean threatening uh, the facade of stability because there really isn't stability. And one of the most brilliant things about Einstein's rhetoric and writing that I think is seeing beneath the mask the violence that's there. So, anyway, those are my basic proposals with President. <laughs> Mark, I, I hate to mention this on the, on the uh, heels of two presidential offers, <laughs> uh, but we're just about out of time. Uh, so I wanted to thank everyone for coming and to thank Mark